The title is On Hearing Brahms' First Symphony. During intermission at the Bob Carr concert, I read about Brahms' First Symphony, the most stunning symphonic debut in musical history. That is what the glossy program says, hyperbole or evidence of genius. 132 years beyond the date of its premiere, I wait in hushed anticipation. I read Brahms' haunting words, frustration with his lot. You have no idea what it is like to hear a giant constantly marching behind you. The daunting presence of Beethoven, bullying young Brahms into submission. How dare he write a symphony and tread upon the glory of the master? No, flaunting precedent would never do. Fourteen years he agonized a plan, dithered and delayed, fiddled with ideas. Eight more years would pass before the world would hear that most stunning symphonic debut. And I have struggled through the Beethoven Violin Concerto in D major, masterfully played by Pinkas Zuckerman and the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, but still the giant marching constantly. Now is the time for the Brahms number one. A new soundscape, contrasting shapes and colors, essential themes unfold with grand intensity, the orchestra alive in Brahms' apotheosis. Here is the venture into unknown worlds. Here is the triumph of two decades' work, the glory and the grandeur of the symphony, the irresistible mastery of composition. In awe, I tell my neighbor, I love Brahms. <laughs> Our Randy was relentlessly gracious and grateful, a marvelous pre-modern poet of manners, whose daring new dictum was kindness and laughter, who wielded his wit like the brush of the tanners and buffed us all burnished with the now and what's after? His thespian voice had diminished with age, but resonated breadth and depth stentorian. His tenor had lightened his bass more bountiful. As dew on the moss, his tight rhyme Victorian, his chiaroscuro from bright to bronteful. When sickness besieged him and the muse took his eyes, the myth of the fall he wrote in his life, inscribed on his body, all bludgeoned with pain. Once vivid in words, penned now by his strife, his poems so prophetic, then flourished again. Let this poet's words and turns be for us a clear guide. When we are invited to furl up the main, and allow death's currents to take us far out to sea. When we board dark sleeper car on the everlasting train and stretch our long-lived bodies on birth's century, may we be gracious and grateful for now and all of the rest. to surpass my ability to comprehend that which I am creating. <laughs> this is called words. Listen to the words. The word. The word. The word is my spiritual sustenance. The words are my spirit. The words are my spiritual essence. The sounds, the implications, the enormity of thought, the impossibility of reason, the impossibility of it being anything else. Listen to the sound, the sound, the sound. The sound of thought, of expression, 
of knowledge of all and more and yes. Listen to the sound of the words unraveling until they disappear into themselves, until they mutate, until they begin to change like a chameleon transforming right in front of you, until you begin to understand that there is something more to them than the original context you thought you were expressing. They become bigger than the one who discovered them who formulated them. Sound transfigures into a unique concept and begins to move into previously unknown spheres. Tangents of unoccupied spaces filling with repercussions of translated sound. Sound in motion, like a tongue with legs, walking, talking, moving forward towards a culmination, a revelation. Questions expressed as answers, answers expressed as questions, until seemingly insignificant little sequences of five or eight or ten characters become granite mountains incapable of movement or being circumnavigated. Be cherry your words, the words that you spin. Once released, you cannot recoup them. You cannot restore them to silence, to their former and glorious self. What if it cost you to speak each word a price? What if each word spoken was a minute of your life passing into eternity unused? Would you choose wisely, conscientiously? Be sure of this that what you spend expressing is exactly and precisely what you want yourself to be remembered as in this life and the next one, because that is exactly what it is. No words are ever lost. Nothing dissipates into nothing. They simply change shape, shapeshifters, moving forward into forever as knowledge, memories, sentiments, and love, as tattoos, and scars, and pain, and pleasure. Harsh and hurtful words are tattooed onto you, onto your name, and face, and into the memories of all who absorb the sound, the sound, the sound of anger, and malice, and pain, the same way that the sound of love the sound of kindness, the sound of a kind thought of encouragement and praise and charity is absorbed and mutates into an ethereal and eternal being, a living testament. Serenity is achieved only when the human condition is contented in the knowledge that I have strived to achieve all that the creation of my words are capable of conveying and that I have spent them wisely in the echoes of the fulfillment of my ordained destiny, and that that destiny will radiate everlasting. And would that it be that my last word, the conclusive Amarinthian sound bought and paid for with my last minute on earth, and spent with my final vanishing breath, would be love. Thank you.